In this video, we're going to describe how to calculate the change in entropy in the surroundings. All right, so we're concerning ourselves with the second law, and the second law has the following statement. Uh, the change in entropy in the universe increases for a spontaneous process or is equal to zero if the process is at equilibrium. So equal to zero means equilibrium, and if the entropy of the universe or the change in entropy in the universe for a particular process is positive, it increases, then we will know that the process is spontaneous. You don't have to do anything in order for the process to happen. All right, uh, so this is just fine, but uh, in everything that we have done until now, uh, we have only calculated the change in entropy in the system. And that's just only one of the two ingredi ingredients that you have to calculate the change in entropy in the universe. Remember that we always divide the entire universe into two components, the system and the surroundings. And again, everything that we have done until now in the prior videos in this unit has concerned simply the change in entropy in the system. So what we do here is uh, try to expand our knowledge to calculate the second part of the universe, which is the surroundings. All right, so to calculate that, uh, we actually can use exactly the same uh, thermodynamic definition of entropy as what we have for the system. Right? So we can say that the change in entropy in the surroundings is simply uh, that integral. The integral is the differential of Q reversible over the temperature. Now, because the surroundings are so large, we can uh, always assume uh, in, in all of the problems that we can do that for all intents and purposes, that uh, process will be isothermal in the surroundings, again, because they are so large. So that simplifies the integration a lot, since this temperature is constant. We simply have uh, the following. But we have to make note that this is the uh, heat in the surroundings. OK? All right, so then the question is, well, uh, how do we actually evaluate uh, uh, the heat in the surroundings uh, in the reversible path? Well, for starters, the reversibility is very easy to, ha uh, to handle. As it turns out, the, uh, the surroundings are, again, huge. If you think that, that uh, your system might be a cell or a human or a chemical reaction, the surroundings is the rest of the universe that is not your system. So they're exceedingly large. What this means is that every single change that we're interested in studying in a system, like maybe, uh, you know, uh, aerobic metabolism, uh, however many joules you have involved in that process, uh, it will be infinitesimal from the point of view of the surroundings. Again, remember that the surroundings are just the entire universe except for the system, right? So everything in the surroundings is really infinitesimal, and what that means is that everything in the surroundings is reversible, okay? So that actually makes it very easy because we can completely just say, well, if everything is reversible, we don't have to worry about that, okay? This is just the heat in the surroundings, period. But the question is then, well, how do you then determine what is the heat in the surroundings? And here's where the problem is, because the surroundings are so large that are very, very difficult to characterize, right? So on the other hand, we're really good at uh, tracking the system, right? That's where uh, what we can uh, do quite well, right? So what we actually do is to recognize that when you have a system Right. Uh, again, we know very well how to uh, determine heat in the system, right? But of course, you realize that the surroundings is everything that is not uh, the system, right? So the surroundings completely engulf the system. So that is going to give us a really good way to determine the heat in the surroundings, right? If you have that one joule uh, of energy as heat is transferred from the system to the surroundings, then you know that the surroundings have absorbed one joule. Conversely. Uh, if uh, the process is endothermic and uh, uh, three joules of energy must be transferred into the system for the process to happen, then you know that the heat uh, in the surroundings will be minus three joules, right? So, so that's how we uh, uh, use the systems to back calculate or to uh, determine what is the heat in the surroundings. In reality, because uh, uh, the system and the surroundings are, are intimately connected, we can say that this applies. All right? Again, every single, every single joule of energy that the uh, system needs or gives off must come from the surroundings or must end up in the surroundings, right? So that's where the change in sign is. If the system is absorbing energy as heat, then the surroundings is releasing 
energy is sent to the system and the other way around. Okay, uh, I have here a subscript that is called actual and this, is, uh, this will be important because uh, this makes a difference uh, uh, with what we have seen for in our work with the changing entropy in the system. Okay, so, so what actually matters here, uh, uh, when you think about the changing entropy in the surroundings, uh, what you have to think is how much energy uh, does the surroundings uh, need to uh, supply or maybe how much energy do the surroundings need to uh, absorb as a consequence of what the system is doing. But what the system is doing in reality actually matters. Right? If you have a process that is, uh, uh, you know, releases 10 uh, joules of energy to the surroundings, now the surroundings get dispersed uh, commensurate to 10 joules of energy absorbed and the attention entropy in the surroundings will increase according to those 10 joules. But if the system is releasing 50 joules, then the surroundings are going to get much more disordered. So the change in entropy in the surroundings will be much more than if only 10 joules are dumped into the surroundings. Right? So what that means is that from the perspective of the surroundings, uh, the pathway that the system is taking actually matters. And this makes a huge difference with uh, what we have seen with respect to the system, where uh, to calculate the change in entropy in the system, the pathway does not matter. This is a really uh, complex um, a, a, a topic and, and something that is going to challenge you until you start to do problems, right? So uh, uh, to just give you a little bit of a taste for how to think about this, I have here a gas expansion that is supposed to help you uh, understand uh, how the change in entropy in the system is a function of the state of the system, but the change in entropy in the surroundings is not a function of the state of the system. Okay, so let's try to see if we can understand that using this gas expansion. Okay, so this is a, an example of a gas expansion that we have used before. You have two moles, uh, 298 Kelvin, and the volume just doubles from uh, 10 liters to 20 liters. The expansion is isothermal. Okay, so notice that uh, to calculate the change in entropy in the system, okay, uh, this uh, is a function of the state of the system, so it really doesn't matter how you do the process. And notice that I'm actually uh, specifying here two different ways to carry out this expansion. First, reversibly, and then against a constant external pressure. Now, uh, the initial state and the final state in both processes is exactly the same. Okay, and what that means is that to the system, uh, the gain in entropy that it, the system is experiencing is going to be exactly the same regardless of how you carry out uh, that expansion. So you will get exactly the same change in entropy in the, surround, in the system uh, uh, using the reversible pathway or carrying out the expansion against a constant external pressure. Now the key or, or the question that we're asking here is well what happens for the surroundings? That's what we're trying to calculate here. So for the surroundings the pathway matters and again the, the expression that we're always going to be using is this one. Okay, there's a change in entropy in the surroundings. Right, so you actually have to figure out uh, what the heat evolved by the system uh, is in actuality. And again, notice that you have here two pathways, and heat is actually path dependent. So you will actually have two different uh, amounts of energy transfer as heat in the reversible path and uh, in the path of constant external pressure. Now, you know how to calculate those from uh, what we've done in the first law. Okay, notice that uh, the system is doing work, it's pushing out the piston. Since the process is isothermal, then uh, the same energy as you get out of work must be supplied from the surroundings to the system. Okay, so if you do actually run the calculations, you find that the heat, in this particular case, some endothermic uh, process, you need to supply energy as heat. In that reversible pathway, the heat is actually maximum. And the amount of uh, uh, heat that you, or the energy transfer as heat that you get is 3.43 kilojoules. That's how much heat you have to uh, uh, supply. Uh, on the same token, the amount of work that you're doing will be minus 3.43 kilojoules per mole, and that would be uh, not per mole, but uh, 3.43 kilojoules. That would be the maximum amount of work that you can get out of that. Now, the second process would be one in which uh, you're doing this against a constant external pressure. So if you actually carry out the calculation of the uh, amount of energy transfer as heat to that process, it won't be maximum, it will be less than this. Okay, and, and again that calculation gives you a value of 1.01 uh, kilojoules. Okay, so notice how, again because heat is a path dependent function, you actually have 
uh, that those heats are different in these uh, uh, two processes. Both are heats from the perspective of the system. Right, so actually, that's all that we need, really, to calculate the tension entropy in the surroundings. The only thing that we have to do is take each one of these heats, flip the sign, because we're talking about the heat that the uh, 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 surroundings are depositing into the system, right? So we change that, and then divide over the temperature, which will be 298 Kelvin, okay? And what that means is that uh, the change in entropy in the surroundings will be different uh, in each one of these two processes. Okay, so um, uh, the numbers then uh, that you're going to get would be the change in entropy in the surroundings. Here will be minus 11.5 joules per Kelvin. And again, this comes simply uh, from dividing the negative of this number over the temperature, which is 298 Kelvin. But in this path, the change in entropy in the surroundings will be smaller, minus 3.40 joules per Kelvin. OK, so I'm going to close this video uh, by uh, uh, trying to rationalize uh, what the magnitudes and the sign of the change in entropy in the surroundings uh, should be. Uh, whether you can anticipate them, so that uh, this idea of the change in entropy in the surroundings uh, starts to make more sense to you. Okay, notice that, again, the surroundings here are going to act as either a place where you dump energy, and that gets deposited throughout the universe, or as a reservoir of energy if the system absorbs it to do some, some process, like what we have here. Okay, so notice that, in this case, the system is uh, uh, needs a supply of energy as heat. Right? So what that means is that the surroundings must organize around that cylinder to dump in the energy. And that is entropically costly because, again, you are organizing the surroundings around that cylinder so that the energy can be uh, put in. Okay, So that is going to res result in, in, in a negative change in entropy. You're getting more organized from the perspective of the surroundings uh, uh, when you're dumping that energy into the system. Now, because uh, uh, the energy that is being absorbed by the system is maximum in the reversal pathway, then the loss of entropy in the surroundings will be larger than when you're actually doing this process against a constant standard pressure where you don't need that much energy as heat, and then the surroundings don't have to organize as much around that system in order for the process to happen. Okay, so with this, uh, we're going to conclude this explanation of how to calculate the change in entropy in the surroundings. In the end, for every single problem, the question that you will be using is this one, and that is going to work effectively, again, for every single problem.